I still have connected. Yeah, yeah, okay. I just, it makes a loud noise when it, when it starts. All right, that's good. We're going to start in 1 John chapter 4 after we have a word of prayer. We'll be in the 10th verse. Yeah, that probably will. By the time, what? Y'all can hear me okay, right? We're back? All right, good. So let's have a word of prayer. We'll begin in first, uh, the book of 1 John, chapter 4. Father, thank you so much for the day that you've given us today. This is the day you've made. It's not yesterday, it's not tomorrow, it's today. This is the day that you've made. We rejoice and we're glad in it. The biggest reason for our rejoicing is that you're in it. You're, you're the source of, of everything that's good in our lives. You're the, you're the most needful thing that we have. We, we need you. Even when we didn't know it, we needed you. And those there are so many out there, billions that are out there that don't know it yet, Father. But we know that we need you. And the fact that you made this day and that you're in it, we praise you. And, and because we know that you're our Father, we ask you, Lord, that you would bless us as your children. That we, would, that we would be in health and prosper even as our souls prosper. Father, work on that part of us, that part that everybody seems to ignore, the soul prospering. Father, help our souls to prosper in you. Father, that you would become and be the most valuable part of our lives and we would live our lives that way for, for, forever. Lord, you are about to do and have done amazing things. Leave our hearts and our minds open to you in every situation. Let our, let our hands and our hearts be against sin in every form. Let we not be tripped up by the simple things that the, the enemy has used to take us over and over or through cycles that have met, been meant for our destruction. Father, you have intended for us to be your disciples, Lord Jesus, to be your disciples, to be those who would go out and take this message, this really good news, to the entire world, starting right here. Father, help us to be able to receive from you the urgency of the calling on our lives and how important it is for us and for the, re for the rest of the people around us in this world that we turn our hearts toward you or that we, be, that we would accomplish the purposes, the fullness of the purposes that you have for our lives and, that we, and our lives would be a testimony of your goodness and the fact that you make us overcomers in you. Lord, we love you and we thank you and we praise you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. The world spends a lot of time trying to tell us what love is. The world spends a lot of time trying to demonstrate what love is and giving us an opinion of what love is supposed to be. First John chapter 4, verse 10. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Sometimes I think we talk about that so much that we don't really get to the heart and the meaning of the message of what it is to take away our sins. And what those sins are and, and what they could possibly do in our lives and the lives of the people around us, in our families, the people that we love, and, and the people that are around us in this world. I want to look at sin today. Sin is transgression of the law. Sin is missing the mark. Sin is rebellion against God. What sin is that? All sin. All sin is transgression of the law. We're going to talk a little bit about sin. All sin is missing the mark, and all sin is rebellion against God. In Galatians chapter 5, Now the works of the flesh, beginning in the 19th verse, Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. 
You know, it's it's always a, a challenge to me when the when the enemy knows that somebody's going to be preaching about sin. You know, I, I I I was I was looking at an article this week, and it was to pastors, and it said, "Are you a preacher or a motivational speaker?" And and I, I said, gee, Lord, I think if we're talking about what the really most important thing I could be talking about on a Sunday morning is that you must be born again. And the reason is sin has been planted around in our lives to, to wreck everything that God has in store for us. Sin has been put out there for us as all of the landmines and the 50 caliber machine guns you could ever possibly imagine to decimate our lives to bring about destruction in relationships, in families. And, 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 and we're seeing this here kind of spelled out, the, 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 the detailing out of, of what Paul is writing to the church in Galatia about the, about the works of the flesh. And they are evident. And they're, they're just as evident today as they were when Paul wrote this. You can look around you and you can see this and sometimes you don't have to look very far. We have to recognize that we are we are in a victorious battle because the battle has already been won against sin. We need to make sure that we're standing solidly in our own lives and in our own hearts for God and against sin because we can't be in both camps at the same time. I had a, We've had a chance to work with some people this last couple of days, you all know who they are. I'm not going to mention their names on here, but one of them was just in here, and then there are a couple that um, that are they're they're going. They've got different visions. They've got they've got different sin patterns, and they're off in different directions. And 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 they all want to claim Jesus. You know what? Everybody wants to claim Jesus. I want to tell you, but but the but the Word of God says. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. We have to stand vehemently, actively, proactively against sin in our lives and in the lives of people around us. We need to stand. We need to love the sinner and hate the sin. And as I, I look at, as I was looking at these three people, I realized that they they all have these things that 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 they they're willingly giving into now I'm, I'm seeing some willingness in some areas for them to to repent and believe the gospel in those areas and receive the deliverance that, the, that God has for them but here's what I know that you can come and have a a sip of Jesus on Sunday morning and be in the hog trough by the time you get to Sunday night and and we need to t we need to stand for righteousness and against sin all right, so let's go into this a little bit more because they're just the Lord just kept pouring this out to me as He showed me what I was supposed to talk about. And the reason is there are a lot of people around the world who are getting this. This is getting out. I'm watching kind of the Google thing that gives us worth getting more views. There are a lot of people there. Are usually by the time a week is over, 100, 150 people have looked at the message. And, and we'll have an opportunity to get it out even more. And I think that God's going to use us going forward. I was talking to some people that, that this has been on my heart for a while, and I, I don't know exactly when it's happening, but I know that sometime in the next year-ish, year and a half-ish, we're going to do a tent revival. We're, and we're going to, we're going to promote it, and, and Valentine, and Balmeray, and, and Alpine. and We'll do it out on some other property where, where people don't have to drive over the rocks to get to it. But the idea is, it's time for that. <clears throat> and it's and, and it, praise God for Blois Camp Meeting, but I'll tell you what we need. We need a revival. We need a revival where, where sin, where, where people are not, we're not tiptoeing around on the fact that if you want to have any piece of eternity or any piece of the abundant life that Christ has for you, sin cannot be a part of your life. And and I, I am amazed just how prevalent drug addiction is right here right oh it, it, you could probably knock on doors and go down and buy your buy whatever drugs you wanted to uh, I'm telling you one out of ten door you'd be able to find whatever you're looking for because what I'm what I'm finding out is people have a proclivity and tendency to continue to go back to sin 
because they'd rather have a short-term fix than a long-term answer. And we need to understand God has called us out of that and into something else. So in Mark chapter 7, Jesus is talking, and he says, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. That's in the 20th verse. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality. Gee, this sounds like a familiar list. Envy, slander, pride, foolishness, all these things come from within and they defile a person. Now, I was thinking about this and, and I was thinking about the, 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 uh, the, the rich man and the tax collector who went in to bring their offering before God and to, and to be before God. And the rich man says, you know, I thank, thank you, God. I'm not like this wicked, traitorous tax collector over here. And he brings these good gifts and he lays them down. And, and, the, and, the, and the, the tax collector comes up. And all he can get out of himself is, Lord, be merciful to me, sinner. We can be like either one of those. Because we may be okay because we've worked out some of the stuff in our lives and those sins aren't part of ours, but, but, but still we, we engage in, well, I was talking to somebody the other day. Um, just yesterday, as a matter of fact, about adultery and the fact that they cannot continue to, to exercise adultery and expect that God is going to make their path any, any smoother than what it is right now because they're intentionally continuing in sin. Now, I, I preached that to them and I told them both. I said, where you need to be tomorrow morning. I don't care if you have to ask for a ride, get to a church somewhere because you need to be hearing the Word of God. We have to begin, begin to develop a sense of urgency about getting the gospel out. Who do you know that you really, I mean, you may have said some, to somebody over your life, go to hell, but who do you know that you really want to go to hell? What are you doing to prevent that? We have a responsibility. We're supposed to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. If it starts getting in too hot in here, you can turn the furnace off anytime. Because it could just be me. All right? It could just be me. All right, yeah. So, at any rate, it says, I'm going to go back over this. For These things come out of the heart of man. Evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, Slander, pride, foolishness, all these things come from within. So you could justify yourself by saying, well, gee, I'm not in adultery. But then you're, you're engaging in character assassination and slander and gossip. What's, what makes you any different than the other person? You think you're going to continue to do what God said not to do because that's not what you're supposed to be doing. And God's going to bless you in your path and make things smoother for you. We have to understand we've got to be vigilant about sin. And if, if you're born again, you need to be vigilant about sin. If you've never been born again or if you're doubting it, whether you're listening to this in person or listening to this over the, over the YouTube, I'm telling you right now, this is your day. You're getting us. You're getting, you can mark this down on January 8, 2023. You had a clear choice between heaven and hell. That's an important thing to remember. You had a choice because one of these days you're going to be standing in front of the Son of Man and we're talking about Jesus Christ and you're going to have to own it. You're going to, you're going to be held accountable for that. We need to recognize that. And, and I, I want to tell you, this is... This is a, the word make a practice in 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning. In other words, it's part of your routine. Well, I only do it every three or four weeks. Okay. It's still part of your routine. Cut it out. Okay. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. And then here's one of the things that got to me as I was reading this. 
John chapter 8, verse 34, Jesus says to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. So, I, you know, we, we were talking about our friend who lives here and, and his uh, tendency to buy plastic cards to pay non-existent Nigerian princes for whatever reason to bequeath him sums of money. And, or whatever the current spiff and spin of the con artist is. And, and, and then we have, we have someone else who likes to go to the slot machines. And, and they only spend everything they have. And, and then, then they need cigarettes and gas and, so they can get to the next time that they can go to play slot machines. And it reminds me of that, that old commercial back in, I think it was the 70s. I, I buy more Coke so I, can, so I can make more money, so I can buy more Coke, so I can make more money. Sin does that. It, and, and this is what Jesus is saying right here. Truly I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. If I said to anybody, if I said to this group or anybody who ever listens to this, how many of you want to be a slave? How many hands do you think are going to go up? Well, I mean, there's some perverted people, but in generally, probably not. Okay? That's not something I, I, don't, I, I don't wake up in the morning and see, you know, other than being a, a bond servant of Jesus Christ, I don't have any desire to be a slave to anybody. All right? I don't see that as being anything positive in my life. And, and so why, why is it that the enemy engages us in sin? Why does the enemy bring temptation across our path? Why, why is it that he wants to tempt us into sin? And why is it that that's beneficial for his program? Because if he does that, he can steal he can kill, and he can destroy. He can steal the dream and vision that you have in your heart. He can steal the purpose out of your life. He can steal your marriage. He can steal your children. He can steal your parents. He can steal everything. He can kill your destiny if you let him. But see, we have to become complicit in that. We have to be part of that. We have to willingly choose, just like, I don't know, what was her name, Eve? She had one rule, one rule. Don't eat that stuff. That's it. And you can live in paradise forever. I don't know. This paradise thing, it's not all it's cracked up to be. It's just perfect, but it's not maybe the best it could be. So I'm going to go eat some of that. Really? <sighs> Doc, it hurts when I do that. By the way, by the way, uh, I was I was I was watching some old hee haw, and uh, and and I I came across the inevitable. Doc, it hurts when I do that. Remember the rest of it? <laughs> Don't do. The, the paramedic responded immediately. He knew exactly what to say. Don't do that. And, and yet, what what is it? What is it? The the and, and the world just tries. To, Satan tries to dress up sin and make sin like look like this is all you've been waiting for all your life, right here. It can be different things. It can be stuff. You know, some people accumulate stuff, and that and that's it for them. You know, that you remember the rich man who said, "I'm going to build more barns. I'm going to have a party." Well, you were, except you're going to die tonight. You know, we need to understand we're here for a purpose, and it's his purpose that we're here. You know, uh, the, uh, the people who serve in, like, for instance, King Charles, you know, they, they, they're, they serve by the grace of the king. They're called to serve whatever the king says. That's what they have to do because he's in charge. We should have that attitude in our lives. All right, I'm going to move on, or I'll, I'll break off into another another sermon. But I I, I got to take we've got to look at at this picture of sin a little bit more and what its effects are. But understand this: that in the last days there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, 
disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Avoid such people. We have to examine our heart. We have to open the word of God and we have to invite the Holy Spirit to search our hearts and say, Lord, is any of this stuff in me? If any of this stuff is in me, please convict me so I can repent of it. Learn to treasure those moments when Holy Spirit comes and and touches your heart and says, you know, maybe you were ignorant up to now, but if you keep doing that, you're going to be deliberately stupid. So don't do that anymore. And I, and I, and I think <laughs> that always gets me because I think about, I think about Ted. I think about mom and dad telling Ted, do not stick anything into the electric socket. Ted goes and finds a nail. <laughs> I wonder what this will. And then, and then, and then. My mom, I don't know if you remember this, but it's a mangle iron. It's, it's like a thing that has a roller thing. It's, my mom said, don't, don't, Ted, don't touch that. And whatever you do, don't pull the handle down. Ted goes over, puts his hand in, pulls the handle down. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is a lot like some, and, and I got to tell you this about my brother Ted too, because when he got to be like about nine or 10 years old, he was going to Maslin Baptist Temple. And he was the most radical evangelist you ever saw in your life. Every car in town had a tract on it because Ted wanted to get the gospel out. And, 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 and the, the thing is, we need, to, we need to listen to God and we need to, we need to allow Holy Spirit to come in and say, hey, look, um, you don't have any self-control. Maybe you need to exercise some discipline. Okay. Um, <clears throat> you know, and, and I... I'm not judging body size, but, you know, we have to wonder about um, about a, a society that has a television program about thousand pound twins. Seriously, I mean, we, we and anything that anything that 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 demonstrates that it's anti God and and all of that stuff, all of this lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having it. How many people do you know that show up on church, show up to church because it's an obligation, and then live however they damn well please? God wants us to have a heart relationship with him because sin will destroy us. He wants to invite us into paradise. The thief cometh only to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you might have life and that more abundantly. He wants to empower us. Listen, he wants to empower us the way he empowered the disciples. I know that because I've seen him do it. I've seen him feed thousands with a couple of cans of beans. I've told you this story before. We had no food on a Wednesday night. And the next day, people started, we didn't, we didn't call the newspapers, we didn't call the television. The next day, people started showing up with food. And when we had so much food, I didn't know what to do with it. I was figuring out how to store it. Within a matter of about 45 minutes, I got a call about somebody who wants to donate or actually store his uh, walk-in cooler and freezer in our barn. And when I asked him if we could use it, it fit perfectly on this little concrete slab right next to where our kitchen was. Listen, I, I, I refuse to believe that is co- coincidence. I got another story. It's closer to now. All right. I'm over in Alpine and I notice about a week and a little over a week ago. And I notice I don't have connection to the network that had happened to me before because the network had been down. So I wanted to verify it. I was right over there by the telephone place where I got my Verizon. And they went in and I went in and they said, no, it's uh, uh, your phone. And I went, okay, well, I don't want to buy. I don't want another phone right now, so can you fix it? So they put a little SIM card in it, and I went down the road. Everything was working. Had to go back to Alpine to take somebody to an MHMR appointment on Friday. The same thing happens. Almost the same place in the road, I lose the network again. Okay, so, and, and, and it could have happened while I was over here. The point of my story could have happened while I was over here or in El Paso or whatever, and I'd have been... I'd had to drive forever to get to the store to get what I needed to get done. But God made sure I was where I needed to be. 
And if, if we'll allow him, that's the kind of direction he wants to bring in our life. And I, I got to deal with a little bit more about sin, and then I want to I want to move into the rest of the story today because there's good news in this. There's good news for anybody who's listening. Then we have desires that aren't godly. We we see sin. We something may trigger a thought or a feeling or whatever, and we go chasing that thing, and we don't give any regard to what the wisdom of God might say about that. That's a desire, and when that desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin when it's fully grown, brings forth death. We need to understand there's a, a lot of finality in that word, death. Except for us as believers, we have a resurrection to look for, uh, a positive resurrection to look forward to. All right, and and I, I mentioned this already before, but I want to bring it again. I underscored it. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. Um this one person we've been talking with and, and counseling a bit has has been a um, I don't know what amount, but I'm sure it's an amount that's destructive to her every time she uses it, even though she thinks not. It's an illicit drug, and she's been a she's probably in her fifties, and she's been a recreational user of this drug since then. And it's it's crystal meth. I can't see that and recreation going together in any way, shape, or form. But, you know, the devil is a liar and he's the father of it. And that's how he pulls people in. And here's the thing. You can clean up a lot of stuff. But if you still have the sin, that's why that lamb wasn't supposed to have any defect. You know, when they offered him the Passover lamb, not spot or blemish. We're supposed to recognize what that means. We're not acceptable. We're not acceptable before God. When we come to bring our offering before God and we've got sin in our life, that's just some money we're paying him off with. We need to understand he wants a heart relationship, and that means we've got to stop practicing sin. And here's the thing. It's the ways wages of sin is death. I'm going to get to edit a little bit here. I forgot to do that earlier. Make that proper size. So we can see it. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So, all of that being said, we know the way. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. We know that that the wages of sin is death. We've had that conversation before. Everybody in this room has had that conversation with the Lord. I'm convinced of it. Maybe some people here that are listening by YouTube that you've not had this, but we need to recognize, like I said earlier, January 8th, 2023, this is the decision point. If you've not made this decision before, you need to make this now. You need to, you, need, you can either continue to sin and understand it's going to drag you down, not only in this life, but eternally away from God and all that's good. Or you can turn to Christ and you can confess Christ, you can repent of your sin, and you can become vigilant about getting sin out of your life. And start with you. Before you start picking, before you decide that you're going to become a fruit inspector, you might bear some fruit of your own. God did not call you to be a fruit inspector. He called you to bear fruit. All right, now here's the here's the thing that's going to, this is going to hit you because I know when I first thought about this, you see, we get in this intimate relationship with Jesus. And, and and we're walking along with him and we know the right thing. And and this is this is the thing that arrested me several years ago. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. It's not just that thing that you commit, that act that you engage in, the thought that you allow to grow legs and become words and become actions and possibly become habits and possibly degrade your character. It's when you know to do the right thing and then you opt out. You want to take a different path. You've got a better idea. You think your name is Ford. Ford has a better idea. 
Except if, if it's found on the road dead, then it's a different thing. That must be a Chevy thing. I don't know. Anyway, <clears throat> we have in Proverbs chapter 3 a recipe. And it's from Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. We need to get to that place about every, every substantial issue in our life. Spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically, financially, relationally, we've got to be at that place. We have to be trusting him with all of our heart and not leaning on our own understanding. And allow ourselves to be disciplined to that point. That means we, 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 we need to submit ourselves to him. We, we need to put everything in his, in his purview. We need to allow him to give us the wisdom that we need to make the decisions that maybe we put ourselves in the habit of making over the years or decades. We need to invite him into those because maybe he has a better plan. That's one of the things I found out whenever I invite him in, his plan is almost 900 times better than mine. So I, I, need, to, I need to go to him because there's some things that look pretty good to me and I'll go to him and he'll say, you know, you could do that and it could hurt you or you could do that, but I have something better for you. And if, if we'll develop that kind of relationship with him, I want to tell you, he'll let you know in advance. Now, I, 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 I'll, tell you, I'll tell you when I realized that the Holy Spirit was first talk, talking to me. I was a much younger guy, and uh, I had the same, um, my foot in the gas pedal had this relationship. And, uh, and, and I, would, I would be going down the highways in, in Ohio, and I would get, a state trooper alert in the back of my head. This was back before they had the radar. You could put on the detector, you know, like that map thing that you have on your phone and it says speed trap ahead. I got that like three decades or so early. And and, I, and it was amazing. It would, I, it would happen over and over again. And, and so what I'm finding is, is I'm walking my life out with the Lord and I'm in that habit of listening. See, because sometimes people think praying is all about talking. Praying is about listening. So we develop that prayerful attitude and that habit of listening because we're intimate with him and we've invited him into our lives. He'll tell us. The word says, you'll hear, you'll hear him whispering in your ear, this is the way, go in it. Or stop here. You know, he'll tell us. If we have that relationship, we don't have to be engaging ourselves and figuring everything out because he's already got the answer. So we need to be productive in our relationship with the Lord. And I don't know how far we're going to get into that today, but let me get to this next slide. This is the most important thing. After talking about sin, after talking about the destructiveness that that, that sin can work out, after that huge chasm, because sin and God don't live in the same place ever. You'll not see sin in the presence of God. See, we've, we've been... We've been delivered by the blood of Jesus Christ from the power of sin. But when we're there, we're delivered from the presence of sin. There's no sin in the presence of God. And, and so that great chasm that was put in place because of that sin that, that so easily besets us, no, don't, can't just blame Eve, Adam was in on it too, and then everybody else after that. All right, we need to understand that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And again, for God did not send his love, his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God has a good plan for us. And I, I, I keep that slide up there because it reminds me. Let me see where else we're going today. This is the place. I was reading this earlier this week. This is David. He's in the deserts of Judah. He's talking to God. Oh God, you are my God. I earnestly search for you. My soul thirsts for you. My whole body longs for you in this parched and weary land where there's no water. I have seen you in your sanctuary and gazed upon your power and glory. Your unfailing love is better than life itself. How I praise you. I will praise you as long as I live lifting up my hands to you in prayer. You satisfy me more than the richest feast. I will praise you with songs of joy. I lie awake thinking of you, meditating on you through the night, 
because you are my helper. I sing for joy in the shadow of your wings. You think of David first thought, is it shepherd boy or king? Or great, 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 I don't know how many greats, grandfather of Jesus. What do you think about? You know what the Lord was showing me? You know how how David, when the prophet came, because Saul screwed up, the prophet came, Samuel came to David's dad because he told him that's where he was going to go. You remember where David was? He wasn't in there at the big meal. He was out taking care of his father's sheep. He was the least of these. And I, and I want to, I want to tell you what the Lord showed me as I was as I was praying and meditating about David this week. God is in the habit of taking the least of these and giving them the platform to establish his kingdom. And for that for for us that means being his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. What was it that got David in trouble? When he got to be king, sin. Like everybody, okay, we need to recognize God has in every every one of us who's out in the in in the field taking care of the sheep, whatever our whatever our day to day, every ordinary person that there is, God, God has a supernatural purpose for you. Because he's not willing that any should perish. He's prepared your heart. He's prepared your mind. He's given you the experience to be able to be his witness. And, and I got to tell you, this hit me really hard last week. And I, and I think I've actually got it on a slide here. In fact, it might even be the next one. But I may have to come back to this for a second. Why does the devil keep us chasing our tails with sin? He's more okay with us being a believer than he is with us, with us being a disciple. Okay, did you hear what I said? He's way, the devil's way more okay with us being a believer. You know why? Because the devils believe and tremble. What the devil wants us chasing our tails about, what, why he wants to keep us in, enmeshed in sin, is he doesn't want us being a disciple. And if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, then you have a responsibility to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. This, this is not armchair quarterback town. Everybody plays. There's room on the whole. Everybody everybody on the team has a role. And we need to fill that role. We need to be the disciple that God has called us to be. And, 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 and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tug on this, and then i got two more slides and we'll be done. Then he said to the crowd, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross daily, and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world, but you yourself are lost or destroyed? We, being a, being a disciple of Christ means we have to lay down our life and pick up the cross. Now, I, 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 know, I know that people portray that as somehow the pain of enduring that picking up the cross leads us to holiness. What the pain does is it teaches us to persevere. You understand what I'm saying? We're pursuing holiness. Pain isn't holiness in and of itself. But as as we're allowing him to come in and sanctify us, as we're picking up our cross daily, not every not once a week, not a couple times a month, but if we pick up our cross daily and we're following him, what we're what he's teaching us is what he showed us on the Via Della Rosa, and that is taking every step. He had to persevere to get all the way to the top of Calvary, to be nailed on that cross and die, just as it said in prophecy. Because he, he the word says, because of the, the pleasures, the fact he's going, he's going home to be with dad and he had accomplished the mission that he came for, that was set before him. He endured the cross. God's calling us to endure that picking up the cross daily and following after Christ. Because as we do that, we learn to persevere. He develops in us the character that we need to have to be the apostles, the prophets, the pastors, the teachers, the evangelists. The, hey, can I bring you to church? Can Can I invite you to church? Can I tell you to get off of your dead butt and go to church this weekend? 
because you need to, because I don't want to see you go to hell. And, and I know that's radical, but do you want to see them go to hell? Really? What are you willing to do about that? It's a personal responsibility and a collective responsibility. All right, I'm going to go back to this. All right. <clears throat> Here's the thing. This has been a challenging pursuing, just going kind of back into my own life here. So I pastored this church as a homeless shelter for 10 years. Um, we take in a, a couple um, and a, a little three-year-old girl to stay with us because, you know, we're kind of stuck with that ministry. So trying to figure out what the Lord wants us to do next. And my wife at the time runs off with this guy. They start a relationship, break up two marriages. I'm like crushed. Okay, the Lord brings me Tracy. She comes in, helps raise my kids and, and do all that. So during this time, um, I, 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 the Lord had called me back into business because I got a bunch of kids, like 10. Okay, and, 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 and I wasn't going to be able to go out in the streets and get offerings, so, although I hear some of those people who are collecting money are making pretty good bank on a day-to-day -day basis. But I wasn't called to do that. The Lord called me to go back into business. And as I did, I was starting up in the, had been in the engineering field as an operations officer right from 2000, from 2000 to 2008. So 2007-ish, started forming another company and got to 2008 and had all the money was ready to come in and fund the company. And we had the 2008 financial crash. We had signed documents and everything. The guy said, no, I'm not putting any money into anything right now. So that went under. And then, of course, you know, we've talked about cancer and all this other stuff. The thing is, Psalm 34 says, many hardships and perplexing circumstances confront the righteous, but the Lord rescues him from them all. I can testify that's true. Every single time I've needed God to show up, what, whatever it was, he's been there. Jesus is faithful 100% of the time. And so why am I saying that? Because, well, first of all, I'm going to read this one first. This is Exodus chapter 14, 13 through 15. It's kind of a, kind of a reflection of what we just read from Psalm 34. But Moses told the people, don't be afraid. Just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. The Egyptians you see today will never be seen again. The Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. <laughs> and then after Moses basically tells, the, tells all the people, cool it, the Lord says, hey, why are you talking to me? Why are you crying out to me? Get these people moving. Tell them to get moving. You see, where we get in our lives is in addition to the obvious destruction that the enemy wants to wreck in our lives with, Christ, with, with sin, that Christ has solved the problem for, he wants us to be perplexed. He wants us to stand still. He wants us to be frozen so that we're not advancing. If God's called you to something and you know he's called you to something, get on with it. Don't wait for the circumstances to fall in place. He'll put everything in order that needs to be in order. I, I, I can tell you that because that's exactly how you see it happening in the word. Where was Peter when Jesus called him? Fishing. And what did Peter do when Jesus called him? He left everything and followed him. That's what he's calling us to do today. That's what I've tried to do in my life. As he's called me. Is to follow him. And, and do what he wants me to do. Tell the people to get moving. Get moving people. <laughs> you know. I mean come on. Get moving. And, and, and I got to tell you, you know, you're, you're going to sit in here and go, I, yeah, this will never happen here. But I'm going to tell you, the room will be full and it won't just be for funerals or weddings. But more than that, we're going to be around the world. And, 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 and yeah, we're already around the world. We're already touching uh, India and already touching a couple places in Africa. And, 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 the, and the idea is this is what he wants from us. He wants, and I, and I, I love this. Think about this. You ever, you ever hear the story? I'm sure you have if you've been here for a while. Um, it was uh, Elijah and the prophets of Baal. I've talked about it many times. You know, where 
uh, prophets of Baal cut themselves. They're sc screaming all day for the, their God to answer by fire. Doesn't happen, doesn't happen. And then Elijah um, goes over and he, in, in order to, to just show how powerful God is, he dumps buckets of water on the offering and on the wood. You know how easy wet wood is to light. And, and then he just prays and the fire falls. Well, as the Lord was reforming me and bringing me, taking me through the perseverance path I needed to go through and, and the learning path I needed to go through so that I could be ready for what he was giving me, he did that with me. Okay, he wants to, he, he wants to call on me to help bring a new technology that's been proven in Canada to the world, and he plants me on a mountain in the middle of nowhere where maybe I'll have cell signal, maybe I won't. Okay, just think about that for just a minute. But but it's that's you know why? Because when the glory when, when when the results happen, I'm gonna just say, I can't take any credit for this. He did that. <coughs> and and when we get an opportunity. And by the way, Thondra is talking to people who are in tribes who have never heard the gospel before. We're going to have an opportunity to go to India. I believe we're going to have an opportunity to go to India to preach and minister in India. I believe we'll be going to Africa too, but I believe it'll be India first. And, and, I, and I, I see this. I see God bringing this. And as I've, I've watched it happen, the Lord has showed me that that also as part of his word. Because if we're walking in righteousness and we're not allowing, if we're his, we're 100% his, we're sold out for Jesus if Jesus is just all right by me. If we're in that place, then what can happen is limitless. God can move in and, and do things that we could never even dream of. In fact, it says in Ephesians 3, exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or imagine. That's what we're about to see. We have been praying for, and I've, I've been listening to prophets this last couple of weeks because it's the first of the year and it's their thing, and, 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 and I'm hearing a consistency, and that is an outpouring of blessing for the creation of the net that will draw in this harvest. We're at that place. There are souls to rescue, as the song says. There are souls to save right here in the DMR and in Fort Davis and Alpine and just everywhere around and to the uttermost parts of the earth. We're going to be a very effective tool in the hands of the Lord. He's going to provide. He's going to do that. And we each have a part. And the other people that aren't here today and haven't even been here yet, they have a part. God's calling them in. And so as that happens, as we see that unfold, what we're going to see is a wave of salvation. And as we go through that, understand, just like it says here in Psalm 34, many hardships and perplexing circumstances confront the righteous, but the Lord rescues him from them all. And as I've been talking to these people about the sin trap that they're in these last couple of days, and I, I've listened, they were with me for hours in the car, you know, I was preaching all the time. If we weren't listening to praise music and somebody praying on, on, off of my downloaded list, we were. I was preaching to them, and and I was saying, look, God has a plan for you, but you've got to get on His plan, and His plan means that we set sin aside, that we turn our back on sin, we repent, and we believe the gospel, and we have to be willing to do that. And and the reason that they, the reason people continue to turn to sin is why? What does the Bible say about sin? It has its pleasure for a season, but then there's judgment. There's a result from that sin that will steal from us, that will kill dreams and goals and ambitions and kill our character and prevent our destiny if we're not careful. Go ahead, come on up. I could probably preach for a couple hours, but. Well, uh, I want to kind of kind of close out with this. The reason that I talked about sin today and, and is that sometimes it's just a word, but, but it's more than a word. It's a thought that can become words or actions, that can become habits, that could 
become part of our character, they become part of our destiny. We have a, Jeff was over at our house doing some work yesterday. And uh, this fellow came up that we've been working with in ministry, trying to help him along. Um, and he's been through a rough life. Guy was in prison at a very young age. Can't even begin to talk about what that must have been like for him. Lost his dad when he was young. Um, just about anything you could imagine. His mother was addicted, so he became addicted to the same stuff his mother was addicted to. And all of the coping mechanisms that he's had in his life up to now have been to engage in sin, which has its pleasures for a season. But what's happening is it's destroying him. You know, as I was reading from Psalm 63 a little while ago, you can sense the precious intimacy between David and the Lord. His soul is crying out for him like, like somebody who's in the middle of a desert where there's no water. You're the only source, just like honey in the rock. You're the only one that can satisfy. Lord, you're the only one that can satisfy. Jesus tells us, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Here's the thing. Everything we need, everything we desire is in him. The way to get there is in him. The truth about how to get there, well, he's the truth about that, and he's the life that you're dreaming about. The eternity with God, the opportunity to live a meaningful life that will, that will leave a legacy of souls and touch the lives of who knows how many, maybe billions. And I was going to say millions, so the Lord put the bee in my mouth. So I had to spit it out. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And then he says this to us as believers. I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done. Did I tell you, I, I, was, I was preaching in a church and, I, and there was a guy who had been in a wheelchair for years and I went over and I put my hands on him and he got up and walked. It wasn't me. I don't know how to do that stuff. Did I tell you, I was addicted to cocaine. I was using an ounce of cocaine a week. And, I, and, and one night I said, Lord, I can't, if I have to live like this one more day, I'd rather die. And he said, give me your addiction. I paid the price for your deliverance 2,000 years ago. I took him up on it and he didn't lie. I went, through an, I went through a day. I had to endure some stuff. I had to persevere through some stuff. But he was gracious to me because less than a day later, I didn't have any withdrawal symptoms. God does that stuff. And then I realized six weeks later, I hadn't even thought about cocaine for six weeks. It had been the center of my life, but I had a new center. His name is Jesus. You can ask for anything in my name and I will do it that the Father be glorified in the Son. Yes, ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. That's the promise of Jesus to us and there are religionists who want to water down the gospel and say, no, well, you know, maybe not every, not anything, you know, you know, as he, as the Lord willeth. No, this is, he's talking about people who he has intimacy with, his kids, us. Yeah, I'm a little passionate today. Listen, I, 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 I love this. I, I, it's one of my favorite scriptures. You know, not everybody's going to be saved. And a lot of people choose to continue to sin, even knowing, even having heard. But this is what he says to us. I have written this to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know 
that you have eternal life. And we are confident that he hears us whenever we ask for anything that pleases him. And since he know, we know that he hears us when we make our requests, we also know that he will give us what we ask for. You know, that challenges us to almost be Star Trek-ish, boldly go where no one has gone before. God's calling our hearts to that place. But it starts with repenting of sin and believing the gospel. God has a great journey for every person. He has a great purpose. There's not one human being who's been, been, been born without a purpose that God has for them. We have an opportunity to be fulfilled in that purpose if we'll follow him completely. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, first of all, I want to mention the saved, the righteous, the born again, but I want to I want to step away back just for a moment. If I'm, I said righteous, born again, and you didn't identify with that, then I want to talk to you first. I've talked, I, I, I painted about a, as bold a picture of sin as I, I could possibly paint. Everything wicked and evil every transgression of law, and even to the fine point of whatever is not of faith is sin. Lord, sin is baggage. Sin is destructive. And yet so many people embrace sin instead of the love of the Father as expressed in the Son. Lord, right now I, I pray for those who had that little skip of their heartbeat because they either don't know you, Lord Jesus, or they know you and they look at their life and examine it in light of your word and they find themselves in sin. And as the spelling teacher once pointed out, I, even though not grammatically correct, I is always in the middle of sin. Sometimes we're so busy looking at other people's sins that we don't look at our own. Lord, I, I know you and I, you and I have some talks. We, we aren't, we're in a process of being sanctified and there are, Areas of sin that have become comfortable, maybe they're low-level sin or they're just bad habits, whatever it is. But you're cleaning us up in that process. Lord, let us not be judging somebody else's sin because you didn't call us to judge. You called us to love. And Lord, right now on behalf of all of those who are listening who have maybe never made that profession or maybe you did and you're out, kind of on your own again, or at least you feel like you are. You're the prodigal son. You've gone out. You've wasted all the good things the Father gave you. and You don't know what else to do, but come back. Well, come back. Today's the day. Just join me. Lord, I repent. I, I'm sorry for my sin. I see what it does to me. It makes me feel filthy, unclean. I, I want to hide from you the way Adam and Eve hid from you. Lord, I, I'm sorry. Forgive me of my sin. I repent. I turn my back on it. I plead your blood over it, over me, over my life. I believe you died on the cross for me, Lord Jesus. You died on the cross for my sins, all of my sins. And that you arose from the, the, the dead and you're alive today. Come into my life. Be my Savior. Be my King. Be my God. Teach me how to be a disciple, not just a believer. Lord, there, there are a lot of there are a lot of a lot of marginal believers. They're believers and they're kind of disciples when they got the time. Lord, this is our full time. Our full time is a disciple of you. We may be interacting with people we're working with or people that are in the stores or whatever, or people who are our neighbors, but 
our focus is to be a disciple of you. Help us to walk with you and to become more like you as each day passes, each hour passes. Lord, I, I want to thank you because I know you're a healing Jesus. I'm at the, I think today's the day on the, on the chosen third episode where we're going to see this miracle happen. Actually, a couple of miracles. There was Jairus, who's a, kind of the head clerk at the synagogue, a ruler. And, and Lord, he has a daughter who's 12 years old. And she's on death's door. And then there's a woman, a daughter of Abraham, a Jewish woman, who has had an issue of blood for 12 years. She's treated the same as a leper. She's treated unclean. Jesus has come into town. People are thronging around him. This woman has it in her head. If she can just reach out and touch the hem of his garment, that she'll be healed. And so she does. Jesus has a conversation with her. Jairus is right there. and He's been put on hold while Jesus is dealing with this woman. And these guys come with a report saying, it's too late. Don't trouble the teacher. Well, first of all, he's more than a teacher, but hallelujah. Jesus said, don't listen to them. Just believe. So this woman's healed of her issue of blood and Jesus goes to Jairus' house. People are already mourning. Jesus says, shut up, y'all. She's just sleeping. Jesus goes up, takes a couple of his disciples, mom and dad, reaches out, takes the little girl's hand, says, rise up. She does. He's a healing Jesus. I don't care what it is you have. I don't care if it's an annoying cold sore or, or, or a, a tooth cavity or you have AIDS or you have cancer or you have a heart problem or you don't you can't walk. I don't care what it is. He is his name is above every name. If you'll just put your hand right now on whatever part of your body is troubling you, maybe you're dealing with addiction. That's a heart problem or a head problem. You can put them put one hand on both. Wherever that problem is, just put your hand right there. Just believe with me because the word says you can lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. I think that includes your hands if you're a believer. So, Father, I just thank you right now for healing flooding into that area, for the pain leaving, for the stiffness, the soreness, the destruction of that disease leaving, and, and all of the negative effects that it had on that body while it was there. <clears throat> we call those gone. We call that disease gone. We spoke healing right now. And Father, there, in the name of Jesus, I believe there's someone who, who just blinked and they haven't seen before. You showed me somebody who blinked and then they saw and they hadn't seen before. You heal blind eyes. And Lord, I, I, I'm, I'm reminded of the 10 lepers who called out to you. And I was thinking about this in this last week. They said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on us. And you said, go show yourself to the priest. I don't believe necessarily in that instant that they all got clean, all got healed. I think as they were going that 10 or 15 or 20 miles on to go show themselves to the priest, that it started showing up. One person said, hey, my hand, is cl it, it's working. It, my fingers are working. The, the skin is healed. I don't know how it exactly happened, but then all of a sudden it just got, the healing was contagious. Father, I'm believing healing is contagious today. That, that the people who are being healed right now are going to go pray for somebody else and they're going to get healed, that the healing will be contagious. Father, last of all, I want to pray for those who are in relationship issues or business issues or career issues, or you're, you're in, interested in every aspect of our lives. We submit ourselves to you. We surrender ourselves. We humble your, ourselves under your mighty hand. 
Lord, we ask for a restoration of dreams and resources and finances and relationships and marriages, and parents with their children and children with their parents and neighbors. We speak the healing of the heart, the healing of the pocketbook and the checkbook and the business and the opportunity. Don't put limits on Jesus. There's nothing impossible with God. Father, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for your love and kindness. Thank you for the word that you brought. Lord, I, I pray that not any would perish, but all would come to repentance. That I would be the disciple you called me to be. Surrendered 100%. And Lord, that we would all have that same heart so that we could join in the celebration that will last for eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives.